Hi, this is Les Posen, Flightwise Fear of Flying Clinical Psychologist. Welcome to this new video podcast, especially aimed at people who are trying to manage onboard turbulence, or at least the anticipation of turbulence. In previous videos, which have turned out to be um, surprisingly popular, it would seem this is a big problem that people would like to see a solution for. I offered you a model of thinking about aircraft going through turbulent periods as like being suspended in jelly and that you could think about the plane as quite safe in there but being perturbed by the forces of nature at work. Uh, in almost all cases planes can withstand at least 150 percent of the worst that the weather can throw at it but of course to be on the safe side and also to preserve the health of their cabin crew, um, planes will deviate around turbulence, climb above it or go around it or thread its way through very large uh, cloud formations. And they know well in advance of where those things are going to be. That doesn't mean you're not gonna have bumps along the way, but it's like saying, well, I want every road that I'm on to be absolutely smooth, otherwise I can't travel. Well, we know that that's not the case. In this video, I want to build on that and talk to you about some practical things that you can do. I mean, practical things. But it's based on your belief in two things, just two things. Number one, turbulence might be uncomfortable, but it's not unsafe. I don't have to like it to do this flight. This is not about you learning to love roller coasters. If you've had a lifelong history of feeling ill in them, no, this is not going to turn you into a person who loves turbulence. The task is to be able to hold yourself together sufficiently to be able to get to your destination. But more importantly, that no matter what you think the weather's like, when you look out the weather or you see your maps or you use an app to predict turbulence, that you can manage yourself doing this. Some flights will be more pleasant and comfortable than others, and that's just the way it is. I just came back from LA uh, at the uh, beginning of, uh, of April, and I think the first six hours after our 10.30 p.m. departure from LAX, the first six hours was bumpy. Seriously, bumpy. And then we had a little bit of a break, and then coming into Australia uh, on the... Uh, uh, on a Saturday morning, the whole east coast of Australia was covered in cloud, lots of low-level turbulence, and we were, we were told for the last hour of the flight it would be quite bumpy. Well, you need to expect that you're going to be told such stories from the flight deck every so often, and your task has to be, I know what to do about this. Okay? So today it's about knowing what to do. The second thing upon which this video is predicated, apart from the turbulence might be uncomfortable, it's not unsafe, mantra which you need to practice every day. Um, you need to have a fundamental belief that going flying in a commercial aircraft is fundamentally safe. If you can't get to that belief, if you can't believe flying is safe, nothing I'm going to say to you today in this video is useful. Because if you can't get past that belief, it's useless going further in this video. You need to go find some other videos in order to challenge your fundamentally false belief that flying is an inherently dangerous thing. And that if I take this, pli this, this, fla this uh, plane flight, it's just luck of a draw if I make it or not. You don't want to do that. You need to ask yourself, if I go into my car today and I drive to work or drive to a visit somewhere, Am I taking my life in my hands or do I believe that I have sufficient knowledge of how this system works that I can actually make a pretty good guess that I'm going to get to my destination in one piece? Okay, you need to be able to bring that kind of attitude to flying, even though you're not at the controls and you're being a passenger. The task with being in control of things in your life is that you've got to decide when you board the plane when you're going to give up trying to control everything and leave it to the professionals to do their job. Just like you would if you went in for surgery or you catch public transport, you catch a taxi or an Uber. Same kind of thing, except the people on board the plane, the cabin crew and the tech crew and the air traffic controllers are, shall we say, 
far more experienced in a professional way than some of those other people I was just talking about. Let's think about what we're going to do now. Let's start with a pushback and engine startup. I need you to become much more aware of these noises, of the sounds of the movement. And rather than distracting yourself and trying to shut down on those things by using noise cancelling headphones, there's a place and a time for those. I use them all the time, but not during pushback engine startup and the initial taxi sequence. You want to lean into your own experience of those things to validate that what you're experiencing is actually happening, not make believe. And there's a reason for it happening. Okay. The more you distract yourself and try and shut yourself down from these things, the less you will learn about self-management. You'll become totally reliant on distraction and just trying to shut down. Great for pain management. If you're in hospital and getting bandages changed every, every couple of hours, or you're, you're doing renal dialysis and it's a difficult procedure. Yeah, distraction, moving off into a different world, maybe even using one of these things um, in order to enhance your, your move away from what's going on for you. Great, but not during a flying experience. Okay. Next thing. You need to know what to do with your hands during all the phases of the flight that we're going to be doing during taxi and during takeoff. Where should your hands be? Now, I couldn't find a cheap model to hire, so I'm going to use myself up in the corner screen. The wonders of technology allow me to talk to you here, but also at another time, take a video of myself. So I'm going to be the model today. When you're in taxi mode, you need to put down your books, you need to put down your headphones. I need you to focus on what's going on in the plane. Okay. So hands go on your thighs, palms down during taxiing and during the initial takeoff run. Okay. If you watch flight attendants during this period, you will see that from time to time they might cross their arms or sit like this, but at various points of time, they'll, their hands will go on the, their thighs. Here's a picture that I took on a recent flight with uh, Jetstar uh, Airways in Australia uh, when I was sitting at the front uh, of some um, uh, cabin crew at the very front of the plane, looking back down the plane, and that's what they're doing. This is a brace position. It means if we suddenly should come to a stop on the on the tarmac or on the runway, you can brace yourself uh, and stop yourself uh, moving around the cabin, which we don't want to do during the takeoff run. Okay. Now, next part. From time to time during the long taxi, if it should happen to be one, uh, if you find your levels of arousal creeping up a little bit, you've got to be able to label this. This is my fear showing itself to me. This is my threat response being called into action because I've put myself back in a situation where previously I struggled a little bit, where my threat response was easily triggered and now I'm back in there and it's being triggered again. My strong suggestion is you take your dominant hand, in my case it's my right hand, so that your pinky, little finger, rests down here about where your belly button would be. And you want to take a couple of breaths in. So have a look at me being the model and you'll see hand here, gentle breath in through the nose for about a count of four and notice that the hand moves outwards. That's because you're trying to breathe diaphragmatically. Diaphragm is an annulus of muscle like a donut. When it becomes active, it pulls down and out. Okay, down and out. That creates a partial vacuum in your thoracic area here and literally air is sucked in to fill that vacuum in some ways it's very similar to how a plane's wing works to create lift by creating a partial vacuum on top of the wing as compared to the bottom of the wing because it's curvier up the top and literally the plane is sucked into the air there's a little bit of push up as well but literally the, air, the plane is sucked into the air because of the relative negative pressure on top of the wing because of its curvature okay so you need to start to change your breathing. The breathing patterns you don't want to do are, which is a freeze mode, 
great for 30 seconds of avoiding being seen or heard by a wild animal. Uh, or <laughs> panting, which is great if you're about to run away. Okay, or recovering from having run away. But in a plane where there is no actual danger present, you don't want to do breathing patterns that emulate I'm under threat. You want to do something that says, all quiet on the Western Front. You want to say to your threat response system, stand down at ease. I'm going to think my way through this. Okay, that's what you've got to be able to do. And breathing this way, count of four in, pause, maybe four and maybe five out, a little bit longer on the exhale. You're not trying to get rid of air or carbon monoxide. You're trying to regulate the activity of the diaphragm in a smooth, predictable way, which will cause your heart rate to beat in a predictable way. It won't change it necessarily and lower it. It'll simply cause it to beat in a certain more predictable way, all of which sends a message back up to the, the threat response system that says, stand down at ease. It's not about making you calm. Please don't believe those people who say, just take a couple of deep breaths and calm down. Wrong, wrong, wrong. We don't want to do that. That's not the point. The point is to shift attention to something that you've planned to do, which is to say to yourself, turbulence might be uncomfortable. I don't have to like it, but it's safe. I know what to do. This is our mantra. And so breathing in this case is helping you to focus on the right thing to do, which you've rehearsed, which is what these videos are about, of course. So hand here, as we, as we taxi out, just two, three minutes, just to orient yourself. The breath out should be over the lips and you should be able to feel your hand. Now, once you've got yourself settled down a little bit, hands go back on thighs. Do not put them on the seat rests. Once more, do not put them on the seat rests. Okay? Hands on your thighs. This is during the takeoff and taxi clearance. Okay? Now, as the plane moves down the runway, gathering speed, the first eight seconds as we start the takeoff run, it takes about eight seconds for modern jet engines to come up to their thrust setting. Doesn't necessarily mean it's full power because on short hops with less fuel, not many pa passengers on board, perhaps not so much freight, you don't need to push the, the engines to their absolute limit. That's just adding wear and tear and burning up a lot of fuel unnecessary. So pilots calculate the power setting for a particular aircraft on today's flight. Okay, and you push the the thrust levers, you increase the power gently, monitoring all the engines coming up evenly. That's what they're doing. That's why you sometimes hear on big, long, big flights with, with engines, which are huge twin engines, you'll hear two levels of thrust. An initial one, as they're monitoring the power coming up evenly, they're mon monitoring engine temperature, and or exhaust temperature, and then you'll feel the full level of thrust. It takes about eight seconds. Of course, the plane is continuing to accelerate over those eight seconds. Um, but the full thrust that you'll feel being pushed back in is eight seconds. plane moves down the runway keep your hands there on your thighs but as the plane begins to lift off and it runs along the ground for you know a couple of hundred meters or yards as the nose starts to lift off this is rotation okay no starts to no starts to rotate and then enough lift is being um, created or generated by the wings and the plane literally unsticks from the runway, overcomes gravity plus the stickiness, the wheels on the ground and so forth. And the plane is literally sucked into the air. At that point, as we begin to rotate and we come, we change from being a giant bus with wings to a flying machine, your plane will be under the influence of a variety of forces, gravity, drag and so forth, thrust and so forth. And so at that point, uh, for some of you, your inner ear may be most susceptible to all the different movements. And rather than convey to yourself, oh my God, here we go, this is terrible. I need you to move your hands from here to in your lap, palms upwards. As you do this, you take a, no matter where you are in your breathing cycle, you breathe out. 
for about six or eight seconds. You're not trying to get rid of air. You're simply trying to switch on that mechanism in your breathing, that is your respiratory cardiac system that sends a message back to the brain, all quiet in the Western Front. I'm running the show. I'm bringing my intellectual focus to this. That's what this is about. Okay, stand down at ease to your inner meerkat that's doing this, all right? So once more, running on the runway, hands are in brace position. As the plane lifts off and you feel the, the noise changes and rumbling and whatever else it might be, palms upwards, gentle breath out for about six or eight seconds, and then return to normal breathing as the plane climbs out. And you want to be prepared for changes of thrust, changes of engine volume. We've talked about this in a previous video of mine about the sort of why the why the engines change thrust as we climb out and so forth. Okay, so that's takeoff. Now, you start to get a few bumps in cruise, for instance, as we're climbing up. We've now got to cruise. You can expect power to come back. We don't need all that power to climb out compared to takeoff, and we don't need all that power to continue the climb out once we're in cruise so you can actually feel the plane's power coming back a little bit we don't need all that power to sustain a constant altitude okay so power comes back a little bit mm, you may have a momentary illusion of falling but it's only that we're leveling out okay um if you encounter some turbulence let's divide it up into mild moderate and significant that's certainly how the pilots do it on a four or five scale at some point, if it gets to four or five, they'll tell the cabin crew, take your seats no matter where they are in the meal service. Don't even walk around inspecting if anyone's got their seatbelt on. You need to take your seat, okay? Um, but at, at three or below, when the passengers are seated, this is when the cabin crew need to be walking around and checking that seatbelts are on. That's a little hint, by the way, that if you're in sleep mode, you intend to sleep, and you're using a blanket, put the blanket over you and the seatbelt over the blanket. Otherwise, you'll be tapped on the shoulder mid-sleep because I don't want to actually have a look and see what's going on there. Um, they'll be, you'll be tapped on the shoulder to say, is your seatbelt on? So put the seatbelt over so that if you are asleep, the cabin crew can actually see if the seatbelt's on. So keep going, going. Let's keep going here. In turbulence, you need to sit in your seat, palms upwards, okay? Do not sit rigidly. The difficulty is you will reflexively grip the seats, okay? driving blood pressure up and bringing on the threat response, which is exactly what you're trying to avoid. You actually bring it on reflexively. It's quite innate. It's hardwired into us from the times when we were crawling up trees to try and get bananas and coconuts and falling and hitting every branch on the way down. So grabbing like this reflexively. It also means you're always behind the aircraft. You're always reflexively reacting to what the aircraft is doing. You need to be like a good pilot. You need to stay ahead of the aircraft, which means you need to set up, if we get to a three or even a four, your own movement on the plane. So rather than reacting to what the plane is doing, you need to create a zone where you are in charge of your own movements rather than trying to be rigid. This will not keep the plane in the air, by the way. So palms upwards, and I need you to bounce in your chair. Have a look at me being the model here. You bounce in your chair in your own rhythm. You can do, you can sing to yourself, if this is a happy time in your life, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. If Christmas is not a happy time for you, do not choose this song. There may be another song if, if jingle bells is not your culturally significant song. It has to be associated with happy times, okay? Jingle bells, and you find the rhythm. Now, if you struggle with this, or jingle bells is not your song, have a playlist of popular songs that if you had them in your car playing, you would chair dance in your car as long as you're the passenger. If you're the driver, you might sort of bump in along a little bit, but stay in control of the car. But as a passenger, have a playlist, maybe 10 or 20 songs. It goes for 30 or 40 minutes because you're going to have to rotate them. You can't use the one song. Put it on. It's got to have a beat. And you're going to bounce in your chair. Have a look at the model. You're going to bounce in your chair to the beat. Right, we we 
So I'm only giving you little samples of some of the songs that I've used and some of the songs that people have suggested to me. I find all sorts of interesting music then where my patients suggest it from their country of origin or wherever it might be. So here's a few little snippets. I can't use too many long snippets, otherwise YouTube will not be pleased with me. So a few little snippets here, all coming from uh, iTunes, but you can use Spotify. Make sure, by the way, if you use Spotify, uh, you download the songs. Don't use them streaming because you may not have access to them. Uh, uh, if there's no Wi-Fi on board, it's un just unreliable. Have them downloaded, so it's always there. And you have your playlist, okay? Uh, don't use the one track all the time, and don't jump immediately to using your playlist as soon as there's a bump. Try and write it up using your mantra. Turbans might be comfortable, it's not unsafe. I'll do, I know what to do, I'll focus on my breathing. But if it really starts to get up to a three or a four, and, you re and up here on the planet are going, whoa, this is where you've got to take charge. You have to be ahead of the aircraft. In other words, the plane wants to fly. It loves turbulence. Air coming over the wings, it loves it. That's what it's been designed to do. We have not been designed to move through the air in different ways. So we've got to manage ourselves in, a, in an environment that might appear at first to be hostile. It's actually not hostile. It's actually quite good for life. A little bit you know, low in terms of oxygen saturation because we're at the equivalent of six or 8,000 feet, but it's manageable you've got to stay ahead of the aircraft. So you've got to bounce to, the, to your own music. You shouldn't just be slow. You don't have music that's calming you. Calming is an artifact of having done well in this process. It is not the target behavior. Do not aim for calmness. Aim for control of your body. Dance and music or movement and music together are a whole brain activity. Use many more parts of the brain than simply trying to be calm, okay? So you've got to stay ahead of the aircraft. Now, if things turned a bit to cactus, and this isn't working very well, see if you take with you or grab one of the pillows on a long haul flight and hold it to yourself and just squeeze a little bit. This was discovered some time ago um, by a number of interesting researchers who are working on the, on the end of uh, the spectrum disorder, the high performing end, working with animals and discovering that you could calm an animal down bring its level of arousal down, especially before it's about to go and become someone's dinner. Um, if you could squeeze it a little bit. And uh, this person here invented her own system when she got a little bit um, uh, highly aroused and couldn't think straight, to squeeze a little bit, just to calm herself down a little bit. I say calm herself down, meaning to de-arouse, not to enter a state of calmness, just to bring the arousal levels down so she could think again what to do, okay? Again, calmness is not the aim. Calmness is merely an artifact. So you can hold the pillow to yourself and squeeze. I didn't invent this. I was sitting next to a, uh, a passenger, uh, my patient on my right-hand side, and she was holding this. Uh, uh, it was a, a cushion, but it was like a spider. It had all these little legs coming off it. And I said, uh, and she was, I think, 18. And I said, oh, that's an interesting thing you've got. She said, yeah, I've been traveling the world on my own for years now. And I use this every so often when I get a little bit distressed. And I just hold it to myself. And I said to her, can I have a go, please? Explain what, what I do. And I grabbed it and I thought, oh, this is really nice. And then later on, I discovered that other people have been doing this sort of squeeze technique. And in fact, if you've got a dog, you may know that you've got these thunder vests you can put on a dog in times of thunderstorms where dogs can't really, they just lose the plot. Um, and you can put these thunder vests, like squeeze a little bit. There's something about being squeezed. It must come back to, to um, rather primitive parts of our journey from embryo to newborn to becoming self-contained. Um, um, but having that little squeeze just temporarily seems to be able to bring down the arousal levels. So I hope this is useful. Remember, it's predicated on you being able to believe turbulence might be uncomfortable but not unsafe. You need every day for two or three minutes, go onto one of the YouTube videos, and there are now long ones from a company called InFlight Video, like nine hours and 13 hours just looking out the window with the occasional look at the screen to see where you are. And just have it there in the background, but just practice. Put your music on, get your playlist, and practice. When patients come back after their long flights, and we've done this, they'll often say that the two things that really help them were learning how to breathe properly in a way that's consistent with telling yourself, Shh, bring the arousal levels down, I'm in charge, and how to manage their turbulence. So I hope this has been useful. Every day, practice two or three minutes here and there watching the videos, and you'll find it's a significant change 
in the way you manage and anticipate turbulence. Hope it's been useful. More videos to come soon.